thanks, Alistair, for the intro. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really uh, happy to be here today. Um, Alistair asked me to come speak about the startup roller coaster. Uh, there are many different ways um, that we can talk about the startup roller coaster, and I took a particular angle. Uh, just before we do that, actually, l let me um, let me introduce myself. Um, so I'm 41 years old. I'm married. I have two boys, one seven and one ten. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur. I'm a growth guy. I've been an investor. I started my first business when I was 12, so I've been doing this type of stuff for 29 years. And as Alistair said, last year I launched uh, Breathe Life, which is an insure tech that has a vision to, to provide financial security to people wherever and, where, and whoever they are on the planet. And I am a recovering workaholic. So I want to talk about the startup roller coaster. And as I said, there are many different ways that, uh, many different angles that we could talk about it. You know, one way would be to talk about statistics, about um, how hard it is, uh, statistics about um, burnout, depression, things like that. Um, but really what I wanted to do is talk about it more from the angle of, uh, so, of examples and things that I've seen and that I've lived. And uh, you know, I definitely don't want to make this talk about about me particularly, or about the business that uh, we're building today. But given that angle, uh, I will be sharing some stories about you know, how we're trying to do things different and how I'm trying to leverage the learnings that I've made over the last, uh, last little while in, in, in both founding companies, uh, helping other entrepreneurs build their companies, uh, et cetera. So there will be quite a few examples of, of my own experience, some examples from ex external experiences as well, and some of the things that I've seen. So some might ask, um, why me? So I've started businesses uh, at a very, very early age. Some of those were in Montreal. Some of those were in San Francisco. Uh, I've been through two acquisitions, as Alistair mentioned. Uh, I co-founded Founder Fuel, uh, the Montreal-based startup accelerator. Uh, hopefully, you were all at Demo Day last night. Uh, I've been a VC, and I've also done some angel investing of my own. So I've, I've, seen, I've seen quite a lot. Um, in, in, in what I consider a short amount of time. And so with Breathe Life, you know, I'm trying to harness all those learnings, and I'm trying to implement them and bring them into, uh, into this business to do things differently. And so today, I'm, I'm going to talk about a lot of those different things. So first, let's start with uh, a day in the life. So I wake up at 5 AM. I take a 15-minute ice bath. Uh, then I meditate for an hour, and, uh, and I usually eat one meal a day, because I think that food is a distraction. Of course, I'm kidding. <laughs> but this is, uh, this is Jack Dorsey's daily routine, believe it or not. It was all over the Wall Street Journal recently. Uh, and I want to talk about this type of behavior as well. So not really. This is, this is my true... Uh, my true day in the life. So I wake up around 6.30 in the morning, I get the kids off to school, I always eat a very healthy breakfast, uh, I work out uh, twice a week with a personal trainer and my wife that comes to my house, uh, I bike 20 kilometers to and back to the office daily, I'm usually at the office from 9.30 to 5.30, and from 6 to 9, I'm off. 6 to 9 is family time, so I'm not on email, I'm not on phone, I'm not on Slack, it's focused on the family. And sometimes, sometimes, I work after 9, but rarely. And guess what? I think that I can be a great leader and scale a company, and proof is in the pudding, things are going great at Breathe Life. Although, uh, I, wasn't always, I wasn't always like that. So I want to take you through some of uh, my past experiences. So the early signs of my addiction, uh, even in high school, uh, you know, I saw, I, when I look back, you can see some of these signs. So I wasn't satisfied with the, the regular class curriculum, uh, so I convinced the school to let me uh, do extra classes. So I finished high school with 10 extra classes and graduated with honors. Um, in college, uh, all through college, I worked 30 hours a week. I was hosting a radio show, and I was getting great, uh, great grades at school as well. And in university, I was in school full time. I was managing, uh, I was general manager of a restaurant working over 40 hours a week. 
and I was a uh, teacher assistant for two classes. So I've worked very, very hard uh, all through my schooling. I'll fast forward to, um, to my, my days in San Francisco. So in, in 2006, I moved to San Francisco to launch uh, a company called Tiny Pictures. Uh, I was working seven days a week, over 10 hours a day. Uh, I was never taking vacation because I was frowned upon. Uh, family time was a no-no. Um, you know, I'm certainly not proud of the next bullet point, but my son was born on a Saturday afternoon, and I was back at the office on Monday just as if nothing had happened. And looking back, I really think that was a mistake, but it's done. And just one, you know, I'm going to have a couple stats here, but one of the stats is it said today that um, the average San Franciscan only has about six hours of, of me time a day. That's terrible. And this story that I'm telling about me, this was 2006 to 2010. And when I left the Valley uh, in 2010, it's because I was sick of this. I was sick of that, that, uh, that mantra on that go, go, go. And things are just way worse uh, nine years later. So I come back to Montreal <clears throat> and to be closer to my family, literally uh, trying to escape sort of the hustle and bustle of, of SF. And this is when I co-founded Founder Fuel. And I want to draw your attention to this, the tagline. This was the first website when we launched it. It says, uh, say goodbye to your family, your friends, and your pets because you're going to work your ass off. I launched a website with that on it. It's terrible when I look back, right? Uh, but during those days, uh, I, did, I ran the first program, 16 weeks, on my own. Uh, it was hell. Uh, today, they do the same work with four people on staff. So you know, there are uh, many, many examples in my own past of, of sort of that hustle-bustle behavior. And I'm forgetting, but... My second child was born, and two days later, I was hosting Demo Day. So I did, it, I did the same thing twice. All in all, I, was, I gained weight. I was stressed beyond belief. Uh, I was tired. Um, and essentially, I was doing it all, all wrong, right? And, and I'm certainly not alone. And these stories are starting to, to come about. So I got three stories that aren't of my own. Uh, the first one is uh, from a founder that, uh, that I invested in in Founder Fuel. And he actually now has joined us at Breathe Life, so we, we go way back. But he was in the program. He was always first one in, uh, last one out, you know, just uh, eating, uh, eating very poorly, um, you know, drinking a lot of Red Bull and soft drinks, just really not taking care, about, uh, taking care of, his, of his body. And uh, eventually got a wake-up call and got you know, very sick. And uh, it took him two years to realize that he was doing these things all wrong. And now he is uh, a vegetarian. He runs ultra marathons. He literally ran 50 kilometers to work one day and back that same day 50 kilometers. He is total uh, health nut. Story number two is from uh, another startup. Um, there's a senior product manager in this company, uh, parent of two children. One of the two child gets sick and uh, ends up in the hospital, and this person spends a lot of time at the hospital, as he should, with his kid to make sure that, um, that, he, that the child is, is, uh, is making progress and getting cured. Uh, while doing all this, he was still going to work. Um, and you know, to me, I find that is uh, really a terrible behavior. But uh, what's even worse is that the company was, uh, was praising him for, his, for the dedication to the company as opposed to saying, like, what are you doing, right? Go home, take care of your child. Third uh, story, which is much shorter. Um, another founder, things were, were going great. Uh, they raised a good round of funding, and they're planning to move into their new office. And one of his first instincts was, I need to build an area in the office where the team can sleep, because we're going to be working long hours. So these types of behaviors, I mean, it's crazy, right? Uh, but this is happening over and over again. And maybe just by show of hand, I'm curious, who's, are there founders in the room? Okay, great. Awesome. Uh, and all of this, uh, all, all, all these stories um, are sort of showing like the, the human side effects of the type of behavior that, that is existent and predominant in, in startup culture. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been said that, uh, that the, Fatigue that it's causing uh, costs about $100 billion in lost productivity every year. 
So this, this has got to change. <clears throat> so startups are, are a long-term game, right? There just aren't that many startups that are quick to exit, right? The, um, the Instagrams of the world are rare. Most startups take a long time, take years, sometimes even decades. And this notion of a B2C land grab and exit and everyone's happy is very, uh, very rare, right? Most are, or not maybe most, but a lot of them are B2B companies that take a lot of grinding, a lot of time. And these types of organizations take a strong CEO that's building a great culture or a strong co-founding team, maybe I should say, a great culture and being a leader for this organization who's going to war, right? This is a, a, a long-term marathon. It's not a sprint. So I want to talk about some of these things uh, in the coming slides. Uh, let me just get some water first. So before we, um, we take a look at what makes a good CEO, uh, I think we need to define the role of the CEO, which I think is not commonly well understood. I guess I'm one slide behind. Uh, there are three things that the CEO needs to do. Set the vision, build a team, and keep money in the bank. So setting the vision is about you know, portraying the opportunity and chasing that opportunity and doing the right things to get to that, to that vision, to the promised land. Building the team, of course, is about surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you, that are better than you, that know things that you don't know. Because as a CEO or as a co-founder, you certainly don't know everything and you can't do everything. That may sound trivial, but a lot of uh, co-founders have a hard time uh, dedicating and letting, letting the team uh, do things that, that they're better at than they are. And finally, of course, if you're raising capital, or even if you're not raising capital, but if you're hiring a team, you need to keep money in the bank, right? So you need to be able to pay people in order for them to keep coming back to work. And so uh, when I think about my day-to-day, -day, I filter everything that I do with these three things. It's as simple as that. Is, are the things that I'm working on leading towards these three things? If they are, I do it. If they don't, I don't do it. And I'll, you know, I'll get someone else to work on that thing. There are three stakeholders for the CEO. The customers or the clients, uh, the shareholders, if shareholders exist, and, and the team, of course. And so uh, the reason I illustrated on a, on a three-legged stool, this is a very old type of analogy, but uh, in case you don't know, but the idea here is if one of these legs is shorter or longer than the other, the stool falls. Right, so if you're focusing too much on customers, then the, and the, the leg goes longer, the thing is going to tip. If you focus too much on shareholders or on team, it's the same thing. And so the job of the CEO is maintaining this balance between the three to make sure that this, the, the stool doesn't fall down. Uh, of these three stools, uh, of these three uh, share, uh, stakeholders, I think uh, customers and shareholders are very well understood. I think there's a lot of talk about team, but a lot of the talk about team, in my opinion, is, is wrong, right? And so I want to focus on, on, on that one specifically. Right, so the CEO, to me, the CEO KPI is making sure that every, all three of those uh, stakeholders are happy and supporting what the business is doing. So let's talk specifically about the team for the rest of the presentation. So what is not happiness for the team? Well, ping pong tables and foosball and free snacks and free beer and the dog in the office and unlimited vacations, that is not happiness. Yet that's mostly what we hear about. Oh, this startup does, you know, refer someone and you go for a trip, they send you off for a trip for a week and all these types of really superficial benefits, right? These things are short-lived. And sure, they may attract people in the short term, but these are not the things that keep people happy and keep people in the team. And I challenge any one of you in this room that's been at a startup that brought in a ping pong table or a foosball table to, t to tell me that six months later, people are still playing ping pong and still playing foosball. I've seen it many times. We bring in a ping pong table. At first, everyone plays, and whoops, people just forget about it, right? This is not, um, this is not happiness. 
I believe that happiness comes from a good work-life balance. And the trick is finding this balance. And your balance may be different from mine, and, it, and everyone in this room has a different dis, uh, definition of work-life balance. But if you don't have work balance, uh, this, this could lead to, to, to the mental health issue that we're talking about. And you know, don't get me wrong, I'm certainly not up here saying that I breathe life, it's super easy, and we don't work hard. We do work hard, right? But we're trying to create an environment where we, where we have this balance. And essentially, uh, you, know, you want to work, uh, work to live, not live to work. And so many people end up living to work, right? And I just don't believe in that. So what are some of the ideas of, of work-life balance? Well, for me at least, being at home for your family, right? Disconnecting without fear, disconnecting without uh, being worried that someone judges you, being able to just get off work. It's owning your weekends, right? It's being able to go off with your family and friends and not have to check in all the time. And, and, and we at Breathe Life understand that, that life happens, right? So there are times where we're going to pull off a 70-hour week because we have to, because together as a team, we agree to a certain deadline or we agree to accomplish a certain, certain thing and we're, at the, we're down to the wire and we will, we will get it done. But those weeks are the exception, not the norm. And I think that is a problem in the startup world, right? Most startups, the norm is a 70-hour week. But the, the tides are, are turning. Um, founders are finally publicly talking about mental health. So this morning, uh, I was with Jessica at the Accelerator, um, Accelerator Fest, and we talked about mental health. Uh, this talk, she's doing a talk on another stage as well on how to integrate um, mental health into investment theses. And so people are coming out, right? Um, it's no longer, or it's changing at least, no longer are the days like the more you work, the cooler you are, like that badge of honor, like I slept at the office last night. Like that stuff is starting to disappear and it's good that it's starting to disappear. Um, there are communities that are, that, are, that are forming to talk about uh, not just the failures, right, because that's been around for a while, but talking about the pressure that we put on ourselves that our investors put on ourselves, that the board puts on ourselves, and sharing amongst founders and being able to um, learn from each other, right? And, and really um, take steps in the right direction to make sure that, that, that you get through it, because it's a grueling task. Uh, and, and all in all, it's, just, it's something that is no longer behind closed doors, right? It's, it's finally starting to come out. And maybe it's because I'm paying a lot more attention to this than, than I ever have before, and maybe that's why I feel that it's more and more present, but I, but I really do think that entrepreneurs are starting to, to be more vulnerable and, uh, and expose themselves. <clears throat> Part of the problem is that our definition of success is messed up, right? That story that I opened up with, like the 5 a.m. thing, Jack Dorsey, like people, people publish that type of stuff, right? But they're publishing it because it's weird, but it's sort of done in a glorifying way. Or Jack Ma, who says, you know, you got to work six days a week, 12 hours a week for me, or else you don't work for me. Those things are crazy, right? Who, who, who wants that type of environment? And so, um, um, so that definition of what it means to be successful needs to radically change for us to, uh, to start changing behavior. You know, the, the rock star founder that we always talk about, like even that's starting to change. But, you know, the, the fire Festival, you're familiar with, with this whole fiasco. Right, like, ha would that have happened if they hadn't glorified, uh, if they hadn't glorified the founder? Right? Uh, why don't why why do we always hear about bro culture? Right? We hear about these Uber stories and the CEO and all this type of stuff. Like, why do we hear all about those stuff and only about those stuff, those things? Why don't we hear about uh, the good things that companies are doing? Right? The environments where people are striving, and why aren't we showcasing those as opposed to showing the negative side? So with that, I'm going to focus the rest of the presentation on, um, on, uh, on what we're trying to do. <clears throat> but first, um, before I can talk about, uh, before you as a founder can create a great work environment for your team, you first need to focus on your own mental health right, and your work-life balance. If you don't have it yourself, it will transpire, and the team will feel it, and that in of its own creates pressure for the team. 
So here's a list of uh, a few things that some that I do, some that my, 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 my co-founder friends do. Uh, but so I'll walk through them. But like, uh, what if every day when you went, to, went home, you took 45 minutes off email before getting home? Wouldn't you think you'd walk into the house with your, your, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your kids in a much better mindset than if you just closed your email before walking in the door? What if uh, you set off a daily social time or daily family time? You know, that, I've been doing that for a very long time, for about 10 years, and it really makes a big difference. When I'm with the kids, I'm with the kids. I'm not with anyone else. Uh, how many of you email, oh, open your email first thing in the morning, right? Everyone does this, or just about. I make a point, literally, to not open my email before I get to the office. Because I've seen through the, through over the years that if I take my email in the morning, I walk into the office in a completely different mindset. Now I get into the office, I say hello to the team, fist bump everyone, how's it going, blah, blah, blah. It's the first thing I do. And then I take my email. Then I jump in. Uh, having co-founders is, uh, sorry, surrounding yourself with smart people, this is something we hear about all the time. I mentioned it earlier, but you can't do everything as a founder. Find people that are better at you at, certain, uh, uh, at your weaknesses and bring them on the team. Having a co-founder, right? The single founder problem is a big, big problem. If you can't confide into everyone, anyone, uh, how are you going to get through the tough times? So make sure that you have at least two co-founders. Uh, set working hours. So I guess that's a bit similar to uh, the social time. But setting your working hours, I'm at the office from 9.30 to 5.30. That's where I am. And if you need to speak to me in person, you can find me during those times, not before, not after. Um, unplug when not working. You don't need an explanation for that. Schedule me time. Prioritize your physical health. So this is one that is different for everyone, right? My wife, for example, needs to work out a lot because or else she gets really, really stressed. I work out, but not as much, and I'm, I'm, I'm good, right? But doing that physical health and doing things outside of the office that are, um, that are taking your mind off of work. Eating well, of course, is very important, uh, and meditating, right? So these are some ideas um, that you may, you may relate to or not, but a bunch of different things that, that, uh, that you can do. And I, I would think, I would encourage you, to start small, right? Don't start trying to do them all, but start with one, two, add them on, and see, see if it makes an impact, right? And I'm pretty sure it will. So once you've had your own work-life balance, that's when I think uh, you can focus on creating a, a good environment for your team. And so at Breathe Life, we're, we're investing very, very heavily in that, right? As a, as a founder, your strongest asset is the team, right? Without the team, you have nothing. And so we've, make it, made, uh, we've been making a very concerted effort to uh, put a lot of energy, time, and money in, into this part of the business. So I'll walk you through some examples. <clears throat> First off, we created a strong set of values right from the get-go. The co-founders and I, the four of us said, what kind of work environment do we want to create? What kind of people do we want to drive in? And what kind of people do we want in the team? And so we said we need to set values in order to do that. So our values, I won't go through them uh, in detail, but they're human, trusting, proactive, resourceful, and playfulness. Those are the five values that we have. And then the last thing I wanted to do, uh, I was really adamant about this, is like, I don't want to just say, here are our five values and put them on the wall and do nothing about it. How do we hold ourselves accountable to those five values? So we said, why don't we publish them publicly? So what we did is we put them on the website. That's easy. But then we wrote a blog post about each and one of those five, uh, uh, five values and what it meant to us. And the power of that has been amazing, right? Because people can relate to the type of environment that we're trying to create. And people are starting to come to us and say, I want to work with you guys because it feels like it's a great place to work. And then we pushed it even further. We've been in Mark, uh, we started this a year and a half ago. So some of the, co the team members are getting uh, to their 12 year uh, sorry, their 12-month anniversary, so like we need a review system. So what we did is we built our review process around the five values. And we said, are these people behaving in the way that we want them to behave? And if they are not, then we need to have an intervention and, and, and put a plan in, in place to fix it. So our yearly reviews are based on the values. We also make an extra effort for diversity. So we're 26 people. Of those 26, there are eight women, 18 men. There are team members from 10 different nationalities. 
We speak uh, a combined eight different languages. We have people in their 20s, we have people in their 50s, in their 30s, in their 40s, everything in between. And the power of that is unbelievable, right? Because the differences of opinions and how all these different angles come together and create a, a great work environment is really, really, uh, you can feel it. Uh, we act and we behave healthy, right? All, we do team lunch on Monday. Every Monday we have team lunch, we set the course for the week, those lunches are always healthy lunches. We don't order pizza, we don't order any of that type of stuff, it's always healthy. All of our snacks are healthy as well. Our team events are always around physical activity. Our Christmas party was a mountain climbing activity. Our summer party last year, we went to the Eastern Townships, we, were, uh, we did stand-up paddleboard, we did yoga on the stand-up paddleboard, we went water skiing, wakeboarding. Of course, we always end with a dinner, right, to sort of cap the day. But the point is, it's not about the party, right? It's about getting active, doing things together. We have a personal trainer that comes to the office once a week. Uh, we have a running club, softball, volleyball, and, and soccer teams. And those teams are all organized by the team, right? It's not us saying we need to do these things. They all said, let's, let's get a team together, let's do it. Um, and actually, uh, some of you may have heard, tomorrow morning, uh, we partnered with Startup Fest, we're doing Wake Up Fest, and so starting from 6.30 a.m., I know it's early, but the big party's tomorrow night, not tonight. Uh, 6.30 a.m. to 8.30, uh, Wake Up Fest here, we're doing yoga session, we have some prizes, and uh, some DJing and a healthy breakfast. So if you want to join, uh, it's a free event. We also have above average benefits, so very, very generous healthcare benefits. We have a lot of, of people on the, on the team that have kids, and so we want to make sure that everyone is taken care of. We offer the telemedicine service Dialogue, which is one of our sister companies, so our team can speak to uh, a, a, a nurse or a doctor within minutes through their mobile phone. Uh, we have four weeks vacation, and we close that Christ uh, between Christmas and New Year's, so generous on holiday. I'm a big, big believer in taking holidays. I just came back from two weeks myself, and I was completely disconnected. And we also give a birthday day off, so just small things like to encourage people to take some me time. We also put in place uh, all the tools to track and take the feedback from the team. And so we use Office Vibe, so those of, uh, those of you who don't know, but it's a service that sends a weekly email and asks questions to the team to measure things like wellness and stress and improvements, et cetera. So we use that religiously, so much so uh, that we report the results of that into the board, because the board really cares. We have employee NPS, so our employee NPS is 70 which I'm pretty proud of. I think it's really high. Um, and I wrote weekly one-on-ones, uh, just as an example, but we have a lot of mechanisms for, for, for feedback. So the weekly one-on-one -on -one is one. We have a quarterly uh, sync up with, the, with uh, people that report to you. Uh, six months, 12, 12 months, a lot of opportunity to hear from the team, make sure that they're, um, they're happy and that, they're, um, that, they're, that they have an opportunity to provide feedback. <clears throat> so don't um, mistake uh, happiness for not working hard, right? Um, we, we definitely work hard, right? But we're creating an environment where people want to be, people want to give to the company, and people want to be at the office. So when there are those times when I said earlier that uh, we have to rally and we have to put in a big week, the team is happy to do it because because they believe in what we're doing, and they know that the rule of thumb is not to be doing those crazy hours, because none of us want that. And so, um, you know, this is, this is the first time that I've publicly talked about, about, about this, but it's something that I've been sort of, that's been trickling in my head for quite a long time, and in, in building Breathe Life, I'm really seeing the benefits of it, and I'm very, very proud of, of, of what we've accomplished um, so far. So employee retention is really, really key. Those of you in Montreal know how hard it is for recruiting. I see one of the recruiters of Collage here today. Um, it's super, super hard to, to hire. And when you have a great environment and where, where the team members are, are, are sticking around with you, that's actually one of your moats, right? That's one of your defense mechanisms, is like your people want to be there and they're not going to go anywhere. And, and when the times are tough, uh, they're going to stick around. And, and so um, I guess the final thing I would say is 
it's easy to get caught up into those um, super, what I call superficial benefits and how cool would it be to work in that type of environment. But the truth is, those things are short-lived and they don't stick around and, and employees eventually see through that. And so as a founder, I encourage you to try to create a, a, real, uh, a real environment where people want to work uh, because that will, 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 the, the, you'll reap the benefits of that for a very, very long time. And I'll, uh, we, have about, we have a few minutes for questions, but I have one, sl one final slide. And as I was thinking of my presentation last night, I figured this, it's a bit ironic, but it's a quote from John Zimmer, who's the CEO of Lyft, and he says, with happiness comes success. And the reason I think it's ironic is because he's competing against Uber, which you know, we all heard the horror stories of, of Uber. Uh, but but I, I'm a big believer in, in this notion of happiness uh, um, that drives success. But don't forget, like, if you only put uh, effort on, on, on the team, you know, that stool is going gonna, is gonna to fall apart. So you've got to make sure that you're thinking of your team, uh, your shareholders, um, and, uh, and your customers or your clients, or else you won't be successful. So with that, um, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I don't know if you have questions in the room. I'd be happy to answer them. I will be there tomorrow morning. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.